Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who would like the reminder, today is election day, it's November 3rd. Um, we're thrilled to have you all here today. We know that today brings a lot of emotions, um, a lot of anxiety for a lot of us. Um, and I think that, you know, most importantly, we want you to know you're not alone, that we're here with you. You can reach out to any of us, your amazing teaching fellows, Alan and myself, the whole team, we're here um, anytime that you have questions or concerns. Um, we felt it was really important to have today's session, um, even though we want to very much recognize the need to take time to vote largely because this session is such a critical one at this moment. And we have three phenomenal speakers, really um, some of my heroes are here today. And we couldn't be more thrilled to share them with you all. Uh, they're really um, just astounding people in who they are and how they live their lives and what they think about in this world. And so much of this moment is our global awareness of what has ha is happening. And that this is not the first time that the story has been written and this will not be the last time. And the voices that you will hear today really represent some of the most critical and thoughtful voices that are out there in terms of thinking about so many of the larger issues of equity that matter in this moment and in all of the moments that we have come to see in moving forward. And I wanted to frame it just very briefly before I pass the baton over to Alan to introduce our speakers in the context of this election today. And I really want to recognize that we've already had 100 million voters turn out, which is truly unprecedented in, given that we are just officially voting today. And we are on track to have one of the highest voter turnouts since 1900. And I actually went back and looked briefly to see what our trends in voting have been. And I was intrigued to see that um, actually the 1800s were a time of substantial voting um, in this country and that the trend has been really downwards over the 20th century. And so we want to recognize this, that this is a critical election and it has global consequences. And that is why today's um, discussion has real relevance, particularly today. And so on that note, we're going to put up today's poll that we'd like to share with you all and see how you're voting. And we welcome our speakers if they'd like to vote as well. Um, it relates to this election today. So the first question is, and again, all votes are anonymous, just as a friendly reminder. If you have already voted, I intend to vote today or not applicable. Um, what type of state you live in, blue, red, swing, or outside the US? And we'll start with, I think we have, I guess we'll start with those two. Uh, there's a third one, you just have to scroll down. Oh, I'm no. sorry. Okay, sorry, scroll. If you, I, didn't, I didn't know to do that, so there you go. How important was the pandemic in my presidential vote? Very moderately, a little, not at all. Our guests, our guests are welcome to vote also. Okay, wow, you guys are on track. That's fantastic, because I think when we last checked with you all, it was even in the 60 percentile. So we are thrilled to see this. Great that um, we are rounding up the vote by the end of today. Interestingly, 60% live in a blue state and 14% are in a red state and 20% are in a swing state. And then 6% of you are outside the US. So of course, this is probably um, not necessarily applicable. And interestingly, a big spread when it comes to how, how much the pandemic influences your voting decisions today. And I recognize there are a lot of issues on the ballot today. Um, but I think that um, this is just an interesting mix here. So when you look at this very or moderately about half, if you kind of lump everyone together there um, and a little under half are finding this to have little or no influence on their voting. So with that interesting poll statistic, I am going to pass the baton to Alan. Thanks Ingrid. It's great to be here today and it's great to be here, especially with our guest faculty 
I'll just start with one or two quick reflections on the election. Of course, in the 19th century, um, women and African Americans, and many immigrants, didn't have the right to vote. And the right to vote's been contested aggressively throughout the 20th century. And it's such an essential part of how we think about democracy and in many ways, social change. So there is something very you know, important about how many people have voted this year and the energy that's gone in, into the election. I was thinking about the last question, did the pandemic affect the way I think about the election? Certainly, but I realize many people in this election had made up their minds before the pandemic but the pandemic has been such a visceral representation of issues of divisiveness and polarization in our country. And, um, you know, one hopes one way or another that an election is a way of making change. And it has, you know, certainly in the United States, but in so many of the countries where our guest faculty have worked and, the problems of voting and democracy are crucial for the 21st century. Um, I wanted to say just a bit about how Ingrid and I thought about this particular session as we were designing the course, because the pandemic has in some ways reshaped our view of global health. And I know from the guests that we have today that global health has always, for many of us, included the globe, which obviously includes the United States, Western Europe, countries that are wealthy and affluent. Um, but one of the things I think the pandemic has made clear is that the problems of the globe are also located in our communities and our cities and our rural areas and on, um, you know, native lands and in all kinds of places of vulnerability and inequality. And so one of the things I think that those of us who have attended to the wider debates in global health have learned is that in a different generation, we thought about development and how to bring prosperity to poor countries, but in a way that was deep in a colonialist perspective of how to bring our world to them. And one of the things I have learned from our guest speakers today is that there is so much of the world that needs to be brought to us and that if we look just in Boston, for example, the radical disparities in health, vulnerability, and risk are intense. And those are patterns that we see throughout our country that the pandemic has really illuminated. And so as Ingrid and I were thinking about this session, there are so many people who have dedicated their careers to treating people who are poor vulnerable and at risk of disease. And there are so many insights from that work that apply to all of global health. And so we really thought this was an occasion to understand better, certainly issues of the circulation of wealth and resources, but also the circulation of knowledge and insight about how to reduce disparities, how to address problems of an epidemic. And um, so we wanted people who have thought deeply about those questions. And so we really have a remarkable panel of people who have a wide range of experience in thinking about questions of disease, epidemics, vulnerability, and response. And so our first speaker today will be Dr. David Walton, who has committed his whole career to the essential problems of 
equity and equality and vulnerable populations. And he did a very unusual and at the time innovative residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital in global health equity. And this residency has now trained a really remarkable cohort of physicians who have experience around the world addressing fundamental questions of health inequalities among the, vul the most vulnerable. I would say about Dr. Walton's contributions, he has been especially committed to developing infrastructures and institutions and strategies that are sustainable. And um, he worked very closely with Paul Farmer in Partners in Health, and he's the co-founder and CEO of Build Health International, which has worked in more than 20 countries, establishing infrastructure that is sustainable and is committed to delivering care. And so it's really great to welcome him here today. Our second speaker will be Professor Jessica Cohen. And Professor Cohen is an economist who has committed her career to improving health systems and has thought critically using a range of innovative methodological social science tools to think about improving the quality of care through policy, through practices, and through fundamental behavioral changes. She's one of a small group of economists who have combined behavioral psychology, but especially new techniques of randomization that comprise really compelling arguments for how to implement care and implement um, medical and public health interventions. So it's really fantastic to have her here today. She wrote a very, um, a very influential paper on using insecticides in malarial nets that Fox, which many of you read, that's Vox, not Fox, um, which many of you read, um, called one of the most important social science papers of the last decade. So it's great to have you here. Our third speaker today is well known to many of you and well known honestly throughout the world um, for his work um, in treating the poorest and the most vulnerable populations and bringing high quality healthcare, essential medicines and community building um, to these communities his work is especially well known for what he's done in Haiti and Rwanda, but really around the world. And Paul Farmer is not just, you know, somebody who's gone to do good in many difficult and um, places where poverty is sometimes thought to be overwhelming. He's also been one of the most critical thinkers and strategists for reconsidering global health. And we often talk about global health in the most general way, but Paul has a vision of global health built in the field and a critical notion of what global health can be when it is deeply engaged in both social medicine, social justice, and a fundamental basic medical view, that there are people with skills and resources that need to bring those to the vulnerable to restore their health. And I've had a chance to talk to him a lot about this, but Paul believes this is at the core of thinking about healthcare in general. And um, it has a, it's a view that has really influenced me tremendously. Um, I'm, I'm very proud today to have Dr. Farmer here because I first met him when he was a first year medical student. And I would say we studied together um, at that time and we have studied together you know, for 
35 years since then. But I do want to say, you know, the most gratifying thing that can happen for anyone who teaches is to see their students excel and then learn from them. And Paul Farmer's my boss now in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at the medical school. And it's fantastic when you get to work for one of your former students. So it's wonderful to welcome him here today. So we will start with Dr. Walton. Thanks so much to all of you for being here today. Thank you so much. Uh, I will get started. I have a short eight minutes to discuss. So I'm gonna get started. And I will say, as I pull up my uh, stopwatch here, just another um, endorsement to vote. Small anecdote eating into my time. I um, have been recently looking into my ancestors and like many, I identify as black and as many black folk in this country you actually hit a wall in terms of what you're able to see and what you're able to find around 1870. Because 1870, as you all know, was the first time that Blacks were actually counted in the census, uh, therefore seen as people. And I can't find, I mean, I've gone all the way back to my family that was born primarily in the South, came up to Chicago during the Great Migration, um, who were born slaves, but I can't find where they're from and anything before that because they were not considered people, because they were not counted in the census. And so today is especially poignant for me, despite all of the, the implications of this election, that as a black man in this country in 2020, I get to vote. And it's, a, it's you know, I think whatever your identity, whatever your, sort of how you see yourselves and the world, the way the world sees you today is an incredibly important day to exercise that right, that. So many of us didn't have, but even if you or your ancestors did have, it's a privilege and a right for us to have that and for us to exercise that. With that PSA, I'll go into my uh, presentation and share my screen. So I'm going to speak today about health infrastructure because I have a short amount of time. I'm really going to focus on two critical points, particular to COVID and the disparities that COVID um, really sort of plays that play out in um, resource limited settings. Again, you know, I, I speak to resource limited settings as Professor Brandt did in terms of this is also, these are also areas that are in some parts of this country that the majority of my focus has been outside the borders of the US. This first image is essentially something that we have been inundated with in terms of the media and in terms of how we are we are currently understanding droplet and aerosol spread, which isn't new, but rather the spread of COVID. And droplets, you know, that are greater than five microns that typically come out of our mouths fall within six feet. But in fact, the aerosolization and the spread via aerosolization um, has been underscored. Paul Farmer um, can potentially address these comments because he has done a lot of work around these topics with, in regards to tuberculosis uh, and has particular opinions about treating droplets of different species, which of course, which they are not, um, as, as uh, you know, airborne pathogens go. But I put this there, this, this image here, because it's a helpful understanding of, of ventilation and we will leave masks aside because that's a different topic. But then it begs the question, if you look at the photo, and this is a photo that I didn't take, but uh, a, a place that we built most recently in 2018, that's an emergency ward in rural Haiti, in the south of Haiti. This is not an unusual arrangement for a variety of patients. Um, and so you have a large room uh, and you have a variety of patients. This is not, this is pre-COVID by the way. How do you think about controlling infection in the hospital setting, right? And that's the most critical point that I'm particularly focused on, which is healthcare, not in the community necessarily, it's critically important, but the slice of the pie that I'm focusing on is how do we protect staff and patients in the hospital setting or in the care setting? And we have a lot of epidemics to actually <laughs> lean on in terms of how we think about this. 
This is a patient flow diagram and a staff flow diagram from cholera and a cholera treatment center. You know, cholera is again, a very uh, significant uh, infectious, communicable infectious disease spread by the fecal oral route. However, pains are taken, particularly in cholera epidemics, to do fundamental public health interventions, which is identify and segregate patients who come into the healthcare setting and really thinking about things like, that it, sometimes are not necessarily fully appreciated, which is unilateral flow. How do we make sure that the patients aren't backtracking, therefore backtracking potential nosocomial infection or uh, infection spreading within facilities? And so this is critical and things that we've learned from. The other, you know, we can also lean on the Ebola epidemic that I won't talk about too extensively. However, this is a, an image from an Ebola treatment center in Sierra Leone. And again, there's one way in and one way out. And you go from suspected cases, do you have Ebola, do you not, to then confirmed cases. And there's no backtracking. Everyone's in PPE, et cetera. And so and, and again, everyone is segregated from places where patients ideally are going for routine care, child delivery, um, you know, other types of illnesses. And so let's focus on ventilation for a second. Two types of ventilation we'll talk about briefly. One is natural ventilation and the other is mechanical ventilation, both critical to protecting people, whether you're in the community or particularly in the hospital to get treated. Now, this, is a very simple diagram, but essentially we think about a room and we think about ventilation, whether it's natural or mechanical, as air changes per hour. How often does all the air in the room change out per hour? And you see, as it would, as it is probably intuitive that, you know, the less air, if you, the blue line, the less air changes, the less frequent air changes per hour, if you have an airborne pathogen in that room, the higher the probability is for infection. And obviously the more air changes per hour, the less the probability because air is getting circulated, those pathogens are circulating out. Oops, sorry. And so there was this lovely uh, article uh, from Peru and some of our colleagues in Peru that really looks at um, uh, carbon dioxide as a proxy for air changes per hour, which is also you know, used in terms of how we think about airflow. And you can see uh, on this graph, carbon dioxide is measured in part per million. When you have less frequent air changes, carbon dioxide builds up. And when you, op you know, either natural or mechanical ventilation, your carbon dioxide is going down. Again, airflow pathogens are in the air, but circulating out. Again, this particular study I'll highlight, it's very interesting. It actually compares mechanical ventilation to standard ventilation in hospitals built after the 1980s to hospitals built pre-1980s or 1970s. And pre-1970s architecture relied much less heavily on mechanical ventilation and much more heavily on natural ventilation. And this is one example of how we achieved this um, wherever you might be, uh, but we focus really on uh, resource limited settings. The orientation of the building is important to understand the prevailing wind as well as the sun in terms of heat. But again, you have louvers or air places where air can come in, uh, you know, on the wall, cool air comes in and you have louvers on the other, the other wall, sort of higher place because the warm air obviously rises. What's important to understand about this diagram is that those fans that you see are actually not blowing air on like typical fans you feel the breeze they're actually sucking air up to get this air flowing and up primarily to get this airflow moving uh, so you can see this as you can see but also for the um, the germicidal germicidal UV that we'll talk about in a few minutes I'm going to skip this slide and then this leads us really to you know our how we've thought about um, designing, you know, COVID treatment centers. Again, a couple core principles for this diagram. You really want to have a primary screening point where you're making sure that people who are going to your regular hospital top left are ideally do not have signs and symptoms of COVID-19. And people who do, you're going to send them into, you know, if they can go home, fantastic, and segregate and isolate and get social support. But if they can't, need to be hospitalized, 
you're segregating them and, and treating them in the appropriate space. We designed two, one that was without access to testing because again, in the early part of the uh, pandemic here, we had difficulties with testing, but in some places around the world, there's virtually no testing available. The other sort of uh, modification is when you do have testing, and you can actually have a suspect ward where you're trying to figure out whether they do have it or not. And then they can either go into the hospital, leave to go home and or go into the COVID treatment center. This is just a, an idea of what this ward looks like. Um, you're, you're critically spacing people as far apart as possible and then putting barriers to prevent droplet nuclei. And you're, you, we have both employed natural ventilation and mechanical ventilation, air ducts, exhaust fans, et cetera. We, this is uh, pictures of construction that happened earlier in the pandemic in Haiti. You can see these actually taking, you know, taking, taking shape. They're designed to be temporary because we hope COVID-19 is temporary. And you can see some of the principles at play here. I would also underscore that th despite the fact that you might have private rooms, mechanical ventilation, appropriate air changes per hour, it can still happen in our backyard. This is a hospital where I work as a clinician and on my service, on the medicine service, I happen to not be on uh, working there at the time that this happened, but this is a reality for all of us. And the, I'm gonna, brief, I know I'm almost over time, I'm gonna uh, talk briefly about upper room U U uh, germicidal UV, which is really critical in terms of infection and prevention control, really thought about typically with tuberculosis, and that's where it has its mo most, up, up, most of the uptake, but you have UV lights really pointing up above the level of seven feet and you have airflow really if you're in a TB endemic setting, bringing those, the TB bacilli bacteria, which are airborne up into you know, the upper part of the room and that's killed by UV, the UV light. Ideally, uh, more and more we're thinking about this for uh, SARS-CoV-2 as well. And then I'm gonna briefly talk about oxygen because the other really critical component for us in terms of how we think about, you know, this, uh, addressing the disparities is around oxygen. You've heard about dexamethasone potentially, remdesivir, all of those are important, but the real mainstay of therapy for moderate and severe disease is oxygen. Four types of ways in which oxygen is delivered in the healthcare setting. Here is liquid oxygen, almost ubiquitous here in this country, in the US, in some places in um, resource limited settings, but few and far between. More commonly, you have an oxygen concentrator, which is a small machine, at the bedside that creates oxygen sort of extracts nitrogen out of the air and uh, flows uh, flows oxygen, but at a very limited uh, flow of five to 10 liters per minute. Secondly, you have oxygen cylinders that you see on the right that are big and bulky and heavy, but can deliver higher flows of oxygen, which are particularly important with uh, COVID-19. This is what they actually look like in real life. Their cylinders are heavy, uh, sort of cumbersome. They need to be filled somewhere. They're really, really challenging. These are uh, uh, the concentrators. It's a really nice concentrator, actually, bedside concentrator. But the, re the Achilles heel of the concentrators is the need 24 seven electricity. And when you're in a place in rural Haiti, rural Kenya, rural Mozambique, or where have you, that doesn't have 24 seven reliable electricity, these are rendered really uh, problematic because you can't as uh, assure uh, 24 seven delivery of, of oxygen. The, the, the gold standard really that we use in this country and that we, we really advocate for everywhere is oxygen at the bedside. You know, you have a central place that I'll, my last slide that I'll show where oxygen is created. Again, a, a sort of an industrial version of that small bedside oxygen concentrator, taking the nitrogen and the carbon dioxide out of the air, creating pure oxygen. And then you're distributing it through copper pipes to the bedside which is what we have all seen, those of us who either work or have been patients in hospitals, and that's really the gold standard and, and really proven to uh, be critical to better outcomes for patients. This is actually what uh, the nuts and bolts of the, this oxygen concentrating system looks like. Um, it's, it's, it's cre it, the, the, everything has a pl pl pluses and minuses. The minuses are that it takes a lot of electricity, 24 seven electricity, and a fair bit of maintenance. However, for district level hospitals and larger hospitals, say greater than 100 beds or even 50 beds, this is really the, again, I would emphasize the gold standard for therapeutic interventions. I'm not saying the others aren't great, the remdesivir, dexamethasone, et cetera, convalescent plasma, all these things that are sort of a bit on the edge in terms of our benefit. Oxygen, there are no trials because we know it's essential. And so 
you know, when we think about infrastructure and the lack of infrastructure or the failing infrastructure in certain places, you know, ventilation, keeping patients and staff safe from getting infected in the hospital and spreading the disease and really the mainstay of oxygen, which in, you know, it may surprise to hear you that, may be surprising to some of you that in many, many countries, oxygen isn't even available, let alone, um, you know, at the bedside. So I thank you and apologies for going slightly over time and I'll stop sharing my screen. No worries at all. Thanks so much, Dr. Walston. You know, it's a really interesting thing seeing your slides and hearing your talk because we tend so much to think of medical technologies as vaccines and treatments. And one of the things I find so important about your talk is that infrastructure and oxygen are as crucial and ventilation in some ways, you know, things that we knew in the 19th century were crucial to health are really the basis of delivering quality of care. And so I think the presentation really, you know, illustrates one of the things about thinking about global health is what are those mechanics and technologies and design that really will make the delivery of care possible? And it's not simply a vaccine, so. Let's turn to Professor Cohen. Thanks so much. Great, thank you all. Um, can you see my screen? Yeah. Let's see, hold on, I'll start the slideshow. Can you see the screen? Great. Um, so it's a real pleasure, um, an incredible honor to be um, on this panel or to be co-guest lecturing. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just gonna talk um, quickly today about some of the ways that the pandemic has threatened the success of some key, in some key areas of global health. I'll focus most of my attention on malaria, but I'm going to talk at the end of more generally about maternal and infant health. So for those of you who don't know, and I'm sorry, I, I can't take the temperature of the room, so I don't know how much um, background you all have in global health, but malaria is a parasitic disease that's transmitted when mosquitoes bite humans. It's been around uh, since as long as we have, even longer. Um, and um, it causes fever, chills, aches, a host of other symptoms, and can progress to severe illness or death. Um, and even low levels of malaria infection, sort of chronic low levels of infection, um, can lead to um, learning deficits in children, malnutrition, chronic anemia, um, uh, and, um, and, and other conditions. And like I said, this, this disease is, is ancient, has been around a long time. <laughs> um, and so um, here's just a graph of malaria deaths over the last um, 30 years. Um, what you can see is that in the early aughts, in the early 2000s, um, malaria was um, at, at one of its highest points. It was by far the leading cause of child death. Um, and um, over the past 15 years, there's been sort of tremendous, malaria has been a, a real global health success story um, with some inequalities that I'll, that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it, um, the morbidity and mortality burden has declined by um, somewhere between 30 to 50% over the last sort of 15 years. And the majority of that is just from sort of lots of money, lots of scale and pretty effective commodities, sort of bread and butter public health. Um, we don't have a highly effective vaccine yet, but there are a number of other um, really effective tools. Um, you can see down here, these are insecticide treated mosquito nets, which people sleep under to prevent mosquitoes from biting them. Uh, this is uh, artemisinin combination therapy. It's a very effective treatment for malaria. And these are rapid diagnostic tests, which really uh, change the landscape of malaria diagnostic testing. Um, and these are distributed in enormous scale, hundreds of millions of them um, every, every year. Um, and they, um, especially bed nets and ACTs, really drove this sort of impressive decline over the last 15, 20 years. Um, the last few years in malaria have not been quite, uh, for malaria have not been quite as rosy. All of that success has sort of plateaued. In some countries, it's actually beginning to reverse. I think Tanzania is one of them, for example. Um, 
uh, where malaria burdens are rising. And there are still some countries like Nigeria and the Democratic Republic of Congo where the malaria burden is still massive. Um, and so, you know, into that landscape um, came uh, the COVID pandemic. And it's really um, threatened the success of malaria prevention and treatment in essentially every way. Um, so um, this just shows you sort of what it takes to have a successful malaria control program. So first of all, you need to address prevention on many fronts. So people need to sleep under insecticide treated bed nets, uh, particularly young children and pregnant women whose um, uh, immune response is not as strong uh, to malaria. Um, there is presumptive treatment of pregnant women um, and infants. Um, so pregnant women take presumptively take um, anti-malarials. Um, there is seasonal malaria prevention, which is um, in, in areas where malaria is highly seasonal, where they'll, they'll presumptively treat malaria uh, seasonally, especially among children. And then there's insecticide spraying, where you, you know, spray the inside of walls. Um, and then on top of prevention, you really need uh, a health system where um, people have the trust and the confidence um, in the system uh, to um, that, that, that their children will be treated effectively, competently, promptly. Um, and so, you know, the second part of this cascade is that when uh, the, the caregivers, for example, bring their treatment, uh, bring their children for treatment promptly at a health facility. That sounds simple, but actually it's quite, um, it's not the norm. Um, and so, um, you know, you know, those of us um, who have children or who treat children know that you know, most, most illnesses sort of come and go. We assume it's viral. We, you know, sort of wait and see how it goes. Um, and also we often try to first treat things with over-the-counter medications. Malaria is no different. So most people actually first treat a suspected malaria episode with over-the-counter medicines without a diagnostic test. Um, and so, you know, really um, successful malaria control campaigns have encouraged people to seek treatment at you know, professional health facilities um, and then get to this next step where the health workers themselves actually uh, test the child um, or the adult, um, focusing on children here, but um, this applies to adults too, and then assess the case for severity and treat them with the um, appropriate medication. And COVID has really threatened sort of all aspects of this um, of this uh, cascade. So here is um, a paper that came out recently. Uh, it's, a, it's a modeling exercise. So it's not you know, um, imp an empirical uh, data analysis, but it's a modeling exercise um, looking at what the impact of reductions or interruptions in bed net campaigns and um, ACT campaigns. ACT is the medication that's used to treat malaria. Uh, would have on uh, malaria on the malaria burden in malaria endemic countries, and they um, find that um, under you can see here under the interpretation section of their abstract that under pessimistic scenarios, things like twenty five to fifty percent reductions in the number of bed nets that are distributed or uh, malaria treatments that are distributed because of the pandemic, the um, malaria burden would double. Uh, in 2020 um, and would um, reverse essentially two decades of progress. And this is um, not a hypothetical. This has actually happened many times in history. So malaria history is one of sort of resurgence and control, resurgence and control in, in many cases. Um, and the reason is because, um, you know, one of the most challenging things about malaria is that as soon as you sort of take your foot, you know, absent very slow moving changes like you know, prosperity, economic development, changes in the ecology, as soon as you take your foot off the gas with malaria in terms of bed nets and um, prompt treatment, it, it can come right back as long as the mosquitoes are still there. Um, and so we've seen this many times in history. This is a paper by um, some folks from the Clinton Foundation, I think uh, Bruno Muna now has the Gates Foundation and some other that look at um, systematic review of malaria resurgence in history, uh, historically. Uh, this figure shows um, from Kenya, uh, a malaria control program um, from the, the 60s and um, into the 80s uh, that was then ended and um, 
malaria prevalence bounced right back. Here's an example from Nigeria where a program ended and it bounced right back. Uh, Zanzibar is another very good example of places where there have been sort of cycles of control and resurgence. Um, and you can see this in, in India, Bhutan, Pakistan. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've seen, we've seen uh, this happen many times in history. Um, I, I didn't have time to put something, you know, super careful together, but I pulled the health uh, HMIS data from Kenya, where I'm working now. Um, uh, not right at this moment, I'm working from my bedroom, of course, but where I have many uh, programs uh, in Kenya. Um, and this, so this is health, um, uh, health information system data on um, intermittent preventive treatment provided to, uh, for, so presumptive treatment for malaria and pregnancy. Um, and then bed nets distributed to pregnant women. And I pulled every county that has um, some malaria. Uh, and so this is the pandemic. So you can see there's definitely evidence already of um, big declines. This is the percent change from baseline in, um, in presumptive treatment for malaria among pregnant women in some of these counties and bed net distribution to pregnant women in some of these counties during the pandemic. Um, I, I'm, Almost done here. So um, malaria is just one example of a sort of area of global public health where um, progress is really being threatened by the pandemic. So maternal and infant health is similar. There have been amazing gains in especially sort of under five uh, mortality, uh, child mortality, um, and in infant mortality that are threatened. So you know uh, these gains require you know prenatal care, postpartum care safe delivery um, vaccinations for infants. Um, and you already see big declines in prenatal care appointments, I mean, both in the US um, and abroad. Um, and declines in prenatal care appointments can lead to you know, missed detection of complications like hypertensive disorders late in pregnancy and signs of fetal distress, uh, which can increase stillbirths. Uh, declines in postnatal care, for example, can lead to missed opportunities for postpartum contraception, which then have downstream impacts on unintended and short interval pregnancies. And so all of these, you know, all of these um, care delivery um, models that are, you know, rely on inpatient, I'm sorry, outpatient um, care are threatened. Um, you know, there have been a number of creative approaches to these challenges. Um, the, at the Kennedy School Forum, um, there was a talk last week. Um, on um, how the Global Fund has been addressing this. And, and uh, Peter Sand spoke about new types of bed net distribution models during COVID, um, for example. But maintaining these gains is going to be incredibly difficult. For one thing, you know, the global health world is going to be competing for resources, for um, funding. Um, and there's also just a baseline sort of lack of patient and provider confidence that the health systems can um, deliver in this context. Um, you know, one thing we could talk about in the future is how telemedicine, telehealth could step in to um, stopgap some of these declines in, in outpatient care. But, um, you know, this system is obviously not so well developed in low and middle income countries. So I will stop there. That's just a fascinating and important presentation. It made me think about what we can learn from Kenya and malarial nets about what's going on in other places where the pandemic displaces and threatens progress and strategies that we've used to address infectious diseases and systemic chronic diseases. And, you know, I think one of the sad ironies of the pandemic is we've seen people even in a rich country like the US aren't getting the care that they typically would as a result of the pandemic. And one of the things Ingrid and I did early in the course was to introduce the notion that, of course, diseases don't occur one at a time. And our biomedical orientation has often been to say, what can we do about this disease? What can we do about that disease? As opposed to considering some of the broader, if you will, horizontal notions of resources, prevention, non-specific care to a fundamental degree, which might be a very different way about, of thinking about preparedness as we move forward. But I'm so struck by the you know, tragedy of losing ground 
um, in the face of the pandemic. And as you point out, the demands on resources will make it that much more difficult for advocacy to think through these issues in a much more systemic way. So thank you very much. Let's turn to Dr. Farmer. And um, I forgot to mention when I was introducing Dr. Farmer that he has a new book out um, that will be coming out momentarily um, that addresses the questions that arose in his work in West Africa during Ebola. It takes a much broader look at the problem of Ebola for representing essential questions in equity and global health. So thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, I think we just heard um, <clears throat> uh, David Walton uh, show us how we should be thinking about healthcare infrastructure during the current crisis, COVID crisis, which is also linked to in some places, as David said, to uh, other crises, tuberculosis, influenza, other respiratory pathogens, right? And sometimes, you know, just for the students to consider, think about all the efforts that are being taken in, in, in many places to prevent COVID transmission. Uh, these are interventions that will also prevent influenza transmission and tuberculosis transmission for reasons that David Walton uh, laid out. And then you, you have uh, Jessica Cohen um, turn to uh, an analysis of malaria and, and show us this history of disease control followed by a resurgence. You know, and uh, you know, what, what struck me in hearing both of these very fine-grained analyses is that you know, it's so terribly complicated to understand epidemics as you're in the middle of them. And uh, that's why we rely so heavily on historians of epidemic disease who have the time to step back, examine archives, understand social context and understand social history, the histories of whatever period they're looking at. So I'm gonna to try to do that very quickly. In fact, I'll, I'll uh, speed up my presentation so we have time for discussion. I'm just gonna look at the Ebola epidemic uh, in West Africa. And again, here, I was lucky enough to work with David Walton clinically as well. Next slide. So just, and you know, the, the take home points here were all, will all be uh, general and not about specific uh, epi uh, epidemics or pandemics, we're just using them to contemplate uh, broader questions like what are the pathogens and what are the pathogenic forces? Um, and on, in one of these images, you have a, a prison in Siberia, again, David, and I have both worked in, in, in that setting uh, where there are both pathogens and pathogenic forces, the pathogen in question being mycobacterium tuberculosis and the pathogenic forces being, uh, and this isn't meant as a political comment, but the collapse of the Soviet Union, as you can imagine, led to uh, widespread interruption in the very supply chain and commodity chain uh, efforts that uh, Jessica Cohen mentioned. And this led to disastrous uh, out, outcomes in Russia uh, and across the former Soviet Union, and uh, which was the spread of a drug resistant or drug resistant strains. Another image here, we have a meat packing plant um, in the United States. Again, as, as Alan said, global health is global. And then this, this uh, image uh, in the bottom, which I'm just gonna call the blue room. Uh, this is not a picture that that uh, David took or any of us took, uh, but we could have. This is a picture from the New York, a photograph from the New York Times. This is an Ebola treatment unit in West Africa. And I think one thing that you can see is there isn't possibly a lot of treatment going on in that Ebola treatment unit. Uh, there just are not the conditions that David described, but there's just not the staff stuff, space and systems that you would need uh, to respond to Ebola. And, and we felt that very acutely, next slide. Now, just two concepts I wanna uh, um, introduce and I will con consider that enough for our discussion. Uh, the first, uh, and this is something that Alan uh, has written about uh, in, in previous decades and I'm sure he will continue to write about and that is clinical nihilism. And basically, and, and the quotation at the top, you are almost certainly doomed, comes from the best-selling nonfiction fiction 
book about Ebola, uh, the hot hot zone, which described this as a pathogen uh, w- which was going to take out everybody. There's another member of the same family, however, and that's called a Marburg. Uh, and these are both viruses that probably have as their habitats uh, the receding forests of Central, East, and parts of Southern Africa. It's not even entirely clear what the natural reservoir of these pathogens are. These are viruses, as I said, RNA viruses. And the first one uh, was discovered when the transport of monkeys, not for basic science research, but actually for polio vaccine production, um, the transport of monkeys from Uganda to uh, Eastern European cities via London uh, led to an outbreak, the, the equivalent of a nosocomial outbreak inside a laboratory and inside hospitals, the very kind of problems that David Walton is describing uh, interventions to prevent. And uh, there are very many uh, interesting stories about Marburg, which took its name from the first of these cities, Marburg, Germany, but this also hit Frankfurt and Belgrade. But one of the things that struck strikes me now, again, with that s- ability to look back, is even with a completely unknown pathogen, after all, it was just, you know discovered in the course of this outbreak, these outbreaks, the case fatality rate, which I'm going to recommend that we always look at, was uh, close to 20%. In other words, 80% of the Europeans afflicted uh, survived, and and uh, and pretty much 80% of the Africans afflicted in subsequently described epidemics died. And the same pattern would be repeated uh, more recently with Ebola, which was first described in a village called Yambuku. And I put a picture of a nun here because this was uh, occurred with another explosive outbreak of febrile disease, like what was described in Marburg and Frankfurt and Belgrade, but in the middle of a mission hospital that uh, had exactly zero physicians on staff. So, you know, this was a mission hospital without, it had a hundred beds or so, and it was run by a a missionary order of nuns, many of whom perished themselves in the course of the, the epidemic, but where really the pattern that would be described for Marburg, that is person to person transmission uh, with a particular risk for caregivers uh, in both settings, nurses particularly, but also physicians and others working in the hospital and high case fatality rates in Africa where almost all of the outbreaks uh, have ensued. Next slide. So clinical nihilism, clinical nihilism is basically saying hey, there's nothing you can do. This is uh, a disease where everybody's gonna die. Uh, and you'll, you'll see how, how uh, vivid that nihilism was in West Africa. Again, this is just a recap of the Marburg data, but now look at Ebola, um, which you know, is uh, you know, a rebuke to hope uh, and said to be uh, uniformly fatal. Indeed, 70% of uh, um, those afflicted in, and th- these are data from, um, some of these data are from uh, Sierra Leone where David and I were, uh, but no Americans, uh, no white Americans um, who contracted the illness died. Now, of course, this is what case fatality, looking at case fatality can tell you. It doesn't tell you about the size of the numerator or the denominator. It just tells you there's wild variation in fatality. And then come a series of hypotheses, right? Why, what accounts for that? And and I can tell you in a previous century, and even uh, at the beginning of the last one, uh, a lot of the hypotheses would be racially based, but there's no evidence for that. And I'll go into that if we have time in our discussion and answer. Next slide. Now, what does clinical nihilism look like? And I, here I've, I've just taking, taken a couple of examples. I know you'll be familiar with the first one, and that is that it's not cost-effective, sustainable, feasible, reasonable, prudent to treat AIDS in Africa, which was very much a mainstream view in public health, um, if not a mainstream view among America, uh, African clinicians or certainly those living with HIV and dying of it. But it was very, very common 
uh, prior to 2002. And uh, maybe we'll have a chance to look, look at that. But if you look at uh, uh, Marburg and Ebola uh, in these more recent epidemics, you'll see that some of the same uh, forms of clinical nihilism were readily encountered. Um, and, and the second quotation is from a report uh, from Doctors Without Borders, which is the world's largest medical humanitarian organization. Uh, and these are uh, questions from people in Angola, in a small city in Angola, and they just said, hey, you're doctors, why don't you treat us? You know, and I would say, uh, when you're called out for your clinical nihilism by patients, very bad sign. And the next one uh, from about Ebola, I couldn't believe this. Uh, uh, I couldn't believe this. This was so bald, you know. Um, uh, you know, when you read, and and by the way, these guidelines are still online, as far as I can tell. The uh, guidelines for managing pregnant patients with Ebola, basically, um, and and I haven't even taken the most vivid part of it. It basically says there's no hope. Don't touch. Uh, there was actually a no touch policy for people wearing PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. Next slide. Now, what is, and, and again, there's, this is one of the two concepts. And, and another is, uh, is about containment. And uh, here we're going to go into COVID and I'll close. First of all, how did Ebola spread so quickly? Was it, you know, bats attacking us or monkeys or eating a bunch of monkey uh, polluted mangoes or what was the, the kind of speculation uh, that you saw in West Africa and indeed with all Ebola outbreaks is, is highly exoticized. Um, in fact, the uh, epidemic spread, fortunately not into a pandemic, but it spread in three West African countries, uh, Ebola, Guinea and Liberia, sorry, Liberia, Guinea and Sierra Leone, um, it spread from person to person in the course of caregiving, which sounds an awful lot less exotic than thinking about bushmeat and monkeys and bats, right? And what is the last act of caregiving? It's burial of the dead. So clinical care, often by non-professionals, because there were so few in this clinical desert, and burying the dead, the last act of caregiving, account for the great majority of all infections of Ebola and Shirley Marburg. Next slide. And if you look case by case, so these are three uh, uh, patients of ours. It's, it's a story, a similar story again and again. The young woman uh, with the bracelet on her uh, arm is the grand, was the granddaughter of a traditional healer in a rural area. When the, her grandfather fell ill, her father went to care for him. Uh, came uh, the father, the grandfather died. The father came home to Freetown, the capital. His daughter cared for him. For him, her boyfriend and her best friend cared for him, and they all fell ill with Ebola. The ba infant uh, child of this young couple uh, died, along with many others in the family. This is a caregiver's disease. Next slide. Now, one, one back. Now let me let me just uh, close with this. In the United States, and again, I'm gonna to look to Alan Brandt and other historians to uh, check me on this, but in the United States, clinical nihilism is quite hard to do, right? It's been done, right? And the T Tuskegee study, which Alan Brandt has written a lot about, is a good example of saying, well, you know, we're not gonna treat this illness. There was a different set of reasons behind that, but clinical nihilism is very difficult to pursue. For example, it would be difficult to say, hey, here's the standard of care for COVID in Manhattan, and here's a different standard of care for COVID in Brooklyn, right? Uh, that would be widely resisted, I believe, in this country. Containment nihilism, however, that is saying it's too late to stop the epidemic, it's too late to go into the tedious details of con contact tracing, et cetera, that's probably where we are right now as a nation. Um, and uh, you know, there have been many attempts to counter that, um, and a number of us that have been involved in the state of Massachusetts where the governor, um, you know, I, I can't even repeat what he said because he used a profanity that uh, Alan and Ingrid might not wish me to repeat, but he said, I'm so tired of people telling us we can't stop transmission. And so he 
pulled together a group to do just that. And within a couple of weeks, more than 1,200 people recruited become uh, contact tracers in the first statewide program in the United States. But you'll recognize some of these recent headlines, right, from our national experience. By the way, the picture of the young men, those are contact tracers uh, in who are working with Partners in Health in, uh, in Sierra Leone. So this is where we are right now. And what I had hoped to do was to step back and ask, next slide and last slide, and ask, you know, how is this working itself into the bodies of Americans or people on, on this continent or in this country? And, uh, and this is something you have already looked at in, the, in this course. You know, how do racial disparities get into the body if as many social uh, practitioners of social medicine and experts on race will argue this is not a biologically salient category at all, but it's a socially, socially salient category. And that I think is the, the challenge for all of us, not only to understand how these disparities get in the body, but in the spirit of the presentations by David and Jessica, how do we get them out of the body? How do we prevent them from getting in the body and how do we get them out? And let me close there in the interest of uh, the fact that we only have 10 more minutes. Thank you so much, Professor Farmer. It is um, so compelling. And I think, you know, you were answering a lot of the questions as I was thinking about them, about this moment of nihilism here and what we face as a nation. And I guess I would maybe, if I'll take a, a brief liberty to ask all three of you to briefly touch on what you have learned from working globally to address what you're seeing in this country, not just in terms of the clinical nihilism, but the point you made Dr. Farmer about the pathogens and the pathogenic forces that are at play right now. Because I think as you so clearly articulated, this is, what makes epidemics or pandemics explode. And so I would love just to know from your experience working globally, and you all three of you have alluded to this in your discussions, what if there was kind of one major thing that you feel like we can learn from this moment and incorporate into how we are addressing this pandemic in the US, what would you, what would you say that should be? And any of you are welcome to, to take that question. I'll start, and I would say it sounds um, maybe trite, but I, I think we have for a very long time taken public health as an institution for granted, right? Because we are an industrialized nation, we have a lot of wealth, a lot of resources, and so the absence of disease, therefore, or at least typically uh, sort of highly transmissible disease or diseases we see elsewhere in the world that ravage other uh, populations, but are not within our borders, typically, or very few numbers, we, they don't even come up on our radar. Therefore, well, you know, Paul and others at Partners in Health can talk about this better than I can, but even in the state of Massachusetts, where some of us are sitting right now, the public health apparatus here is fractured by having different leadership in all of the 200 or 300 different um, localities. Uh, you know, so we have a, and you see that play out and even in the state approach, I mean, thank goodness for Charlie Baker's, Governor Baker's uh, leadership. But, you know, I think we have, because we have taken uh, public health for granted, when something like this comes and hits us really in the face in a way that we really haven't been, we haven't felt previous to this. And even the HIV epidemic, which was devastating and still is in a, in a variety of places in this country, just didn't, I don't think, have the, the level of contagion, the level of spread, the level of uh, velocity that this, uh, uh, this pandemic has. And I mean, we're, you know, Paul, you know, in, in his discussion with uh, Dr. Jim Kim and uh, Dr. Fauci yesterday talked about this in terms of, you know, these are basic public health interventions. We're not thinking about anything new. We're not doing anything new. Paul's comments around contact tracing you know, I think Paul said yesterday, there, I, I don't think there's a, a, a sort of an infectious, a highly infectious epidemic that has ever been contained without effective contact tracing. And I'm sure in his book coming out in two weeks uh, or yours soon, um, can, you know, it goes into this in great detail. And so 
the the lack of understanding of the importance of public health and in the fact it, it contrasted to the fact that it's so well understood in so many other places that we work it really hits home you know that you know, we really need to embrace the tenets that we espouse you know from USAID to Pepfar to all these other you know US based institutional units finance institutions we tell all these other people to do all these other things and yet at home where it matters most in this in this uh, pandemic for many of us not all of us but for many of us we're incapable of actually putting this into action and that to me seems self-evident and obvious but in fact um, it just speaks volumes about sort of where we are right now thank you that's um, deeply profound and I think in the interest of time, I'll toss it out to our wonderful students, um, since we have a few um, in our chat room. Ivan, do you mind bringing in um, a student question? 